Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Ben. We, um, we're very excited that uh, Leah Gerontoro from Caltech, she's also working on bioelectricity for regeneration. And uh, I think you all know Michael Snyder's work probably uh, on bioelectricity. We had him for a seminar a while ago. Um, and he was doing really fantastic work. I then afterwards contacted Leah, who's doing similar work, who also mentioned in a podcast that she's interested in exploring the longevity space more. Uh, she then um, today had a migraine, so she couldn't make it. She'll be joining us for a virtual salon, but we're now hearing a little bit more on top-down control model to promote more effective aging interventions, also using this um, bioelectricity uh, approach. So thank you so, so much for joining, uh, and please take it away. Yeah, thank you for the great intro. Um, I'm out from St. Louis. My name is Benjamin Anderson. I'm an independent computational biologist. Um, and what I'm about to talk to you about is what I think to be some of the most um, important research being done in the entire space of biology right now that has not yet effectively disseminated into the aging intervention space. And so how I came across this personally is that in addition to my research, I produce podcasts. Um, the show is called the Vance Crow Podcast, and we say that we interview people who spot patterns in business, culture, and science that others don't, or at least haven't yet. And so in fall of 2021, at sort of the height of my personal disillusionment with a lot of other, the other strategies that were being employed in the space of uh, aging, I reached out to Dr. Michael Levin at Tufts University to talk about some of the work that his lab was doing regarding um, uncovering novel regeneration st strategies uh, via what he refers to as the bioelectric code. And so one of the model organisms that Levin's lab works with that is uh, really interesting in the context of aging are planaria. Uh, the reason I say this is because they're highly regenerative and they never get cancer. Um, they are also very cute, as you can see in the picture on the right. Um, and this is an extra special planaria because as you can see, he's got two heads. Um, and so the way that Levin's lab was able to induce this phenotype was not by intervening on um, any of the underlying genome of the species, but rather after uh, cutting a model organism in half, they altered its bioelectric state and uh, were able to um, achieve this phenotype. And not only were they able to achieve it in a single um, model organism, but it was persistent, meaning that as it continued to reproduce, um, this two-headed model showed up again and again. And so, the main control knob that uh, this lab is playing with in, in uh, regards to being able to achieve these sorts of outcomes um, on whole organisms is alterations to the membrane voltage of individual cells. And so what this is, is it's the electrical potential difference between the cell's internal cytoplasm and its extracellular environment. And uh, so anybody who's not familiar with like the concept of voltage from electricity, what this basically just means is like there's how badly does the charge on one side of a barrier want to get to um, the other side? And so in the context of what we're paying attention to here, that barrier is the cell membrane. And so it's really interesting as we can look at the uh, resting membrane potential for a variety of different cell types. So this is just what is the uh, voltage state for different cells whenever they're um, uh, in their um, usual state. And so whenever we place these different cell types sort of on the spectrum of highly depolarized to um, highly polarized, we can see that uh, non-proliferative somatic cell types tend to cluster towards a um, uh, polarized state, and um, highly proliferative and cancerous cell types tend to cluster on the um, depolarized side of um, resting membrane potential. And so for anybody who's kind of interested in this as it pertains to being a uh, control mechanism in, in aging, a couple weeks ago I submitted a literature review implicating membrane voltage in a number of different aging related mechanisms. Um, I've got a preprint of that live, just ask me for it, but I'm gonna talk about this just as I'm wrapping up as it pertains to epigenetic modifications. So I know there's a lot of people in the room that work with epigenetics, um, but what epigenetics are generally speaking are changes that take place at the single cellular level, level that alter the expression of certain genes uh, inside of the cell. So they act as sort of on off switches to gene expression, but um, this doesn't involve changes to the underlying DNA sequence. And so more and more, more work is starting to show how tissue-wide voltage gradients that regulate cell-cell communication between uh, gap junctions and ion channels can actually very precisely tune the epigenetic expression or the epigenetic changes that do take place at the single cellular level. And so uh, this is really interesting, right? Because um, in the context of aging, we've, right, one of our objective is to track aging related epigenetic changes and then understand um, what those look like at different stages of development and then how can we 
plot an intervention that would uh, rejuvenate cells to a younger, younger state. And so me being on the computational side, one of the tools that I spend a lot of time playing with um, and working with is uh, Betsy. So this is a, a sort of computational toolkit put out by Levin's lab. Betsy stands for the Bioelectric Tissue Simulation Engine. And so the biggest use case for Betsy is um, uh, uh, having the ability to take functional data that we generate in the lab and then be able to sort of map that um, back to uh, searching the space of possible interventions in silico. And so you basically would start out by um, taking a 2D grid of cells and setting the initial bioelectric state. And based off of um, the research that's done, we can couple that state to different transcriptional outcomes that we know um, what the if-then statements are for, um, you know, if this happens at this level, then this happens at this tr transcriptonomic level, to then sort of model further and further into that state space. But um, one of the uh, problems for this, generally speaking, because of my interest in aging, is that there's not a whole lot of people coupling these two levels of interactions of the bioelectric state with the um, single cell transcriptonomic state um, in order to uncover, um, uh, to have enough data to continue using tools like this to find new paths forward in order to uh, look for interventions at this bioelectric level that might um, have a strong use case in the context of aging. And so going back to my work on the podcast, uh, something that we always ask our guests at the end of their episodes is, what is their Peter Thiel paradox? And so the way that we phrase this on the show is, what is something that you believe that the rest of the world is overlooking or denying? And so to sort of wrap up today, I'll just give mine, which is that I very much believe that bioelectricity is a key to promote more efficient, precise, and translational reprogramming strategies. And so, yeah, I'm open for questions. Oh, questions, comments, go for it. Yes, Greg. That's a very interesting presentation. I just wonder if you've thought about uh, how you encode enough complexity into the voltage uh, range that you have available to reset the cell to, to explain the epigenetic changes that may take place with aging. When, uh, when you say encode in complexity in, in the voltage In other state. words, you're saying that you can, if you dial in a certain membrane potential, sure. you can dial in a certain state of the cells. Uh, including uh, a certain age. So you were just talking about reprogramming aging, I think, right. uh, by reprogramming the, the cell membrane potential. But uh, the aging of cells, the epigenetic expression of cells, involves hundreds of different uh, changes in gene expression. Mm -hmm. But maybe if you're going from 80 millivolts to 20 millivolts, you've got a 60 millivolt range there. So how do you have enough information encoded in that range of potential voltages to account for the biological changes that are taking place at the transcriptional level. So you're exactly right, and uh, in in the, we've got two axes that we want to understand the change. Right, it's the the um, membrane potential in the range that you just described, but then also that range as it alters over time, um, based off of like the cell states, you know, during different stages of like my um, during the mitotic cycle. And so um, one of the things that's really interesting, you know, there was some work done in like the, I think it was like the mid 50s or 60s by a guy named Clarence Cohn. I would recommend checking out this work. But he shows that, uh, you know, we've been able, to in, it, been able to induce a reversible mitotic block. Um, I don't remember like the compound that he used that would halt the mitotic cycle, but then it, he, it wasn't an indefinite halt. He was able to remove that block and then turn it back on. And so what I mean by that is that by, um, uh, having more experiments like this that sort of don't just look at the cell state as it pertains to across that range, but then also time over different courses of its development. I, 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 I think that um, that would be an effective way to sort of gather more information in regards to how we could better understand these two scales of interaction. We only have time for yeah. one more question. Mm -hmm. Nike, uh, who, oh, Pina, you haven't yeah, just come. follow up on that question. Uh, you referred to some temporal modulation changes in that potential. Mm -hmm. uh, do you, can you add any detail? What is the frequency or you know, what kind of patterns of variations are important here? Yeah, so it, um, it varies uh, from cell type. I don't remember if I have this in one of my. I didn't have it in here. In, in any case, um, I'd love to talk to you afterwards, but I, I think it's, um, it depends on the cell type, like what that range is. So it's like with, say, cell type X, it might be a range of resting membrane potential of like 20 to 60, and I'm just pulling numbers out of thin air, right? Or with the cell type, we might see that it falls within the range of 50 to 70 millivolts. 
And so we can kind of track that, like the, I think it's the G0, G1 phase of mitotic division starts with like a um, K channel or like a potassium influx, which um, kicks it into a um, very polarized state. And then it's, that reverses to then drive sodium and um, calcium back inside of the cell, uh, hyperpolarizing it. And then it's this sort of wave pattern that continues during that cycle. But the range that acts as sort of the action potential driving that um, fluctuation between the range that we're talking about is what sort of varies by cell type. Wonderful. Um, give me your question. What is a frontier that you want people to make progress on? How would I phrase your presentation as a what's okay. next? I think that we need more multi-scale uh, omics data. So like um, mapping these um, states of like what the uh, single cell state looks like um, as it pertains to the say the, whether it's the electrochemical how state. How can we get more? Yeah, yeah, fair, give me one enough. sentence. How, how, can, how can we get more uh, multi-scale omics data? Wonderful. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I can only <laughs> reiterate, if you guys haven't checked out Michael Levin's work on this, it's like, it's mind-boggling. It really looks like it's, it's magic. It's absolutely incredible. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, thank Wonderful. You.